I have to tell you how excited I am uh, that we have uh, Dr. O'Neill here with us today. Uh, I had the opportunity of working with the Frameworks uh, Institute through the early brain and biological development work that they did uh, for the then Norlean Foundation, now the Palix Foundation. And I think we all in Alberta know the core story of child development and how the work that they did really helped us to message and frame the information. So I, I can't tell you how excited I am. Um, the mission of Frameworks Institute is to advance the nonprofit's communication capacity by identifying, translating, and modeling relevant scholarly research for framing the public discourse about social problems. And I have to uh, also tell you that um, we were very lucky, and I think Maura's going Maura's to talk about that today, um, in that they worked with Alberta Health to start looking at what does the public understand and know about what contributes to health in Alberta. And so we're going to have an opportunity to hear that uh, and then talk a little bit about what we can do uh, as well. Um, what impressed me most about frameworks and their work is that they really are applied communications research and knowledge translation, and they use that profit to prepare organizations to expand their constituency base, to build public will, and to further public understanding of specific social issues. Uh, and uh, we're, we're really um, privileged to have had them work in Alberta on two areas, and maybe more in those other areas where they've been working in Alberta. Uh, so Dr. O'Neill works with an interdisciplinary team employing a range of research methods to further public understanding of social issues. She's also involved in efforts to diffuse the organization's evidence-based reframing recommendations through the nonprofit sector. Since joining Frameworks in 2009, she has worked on research projects designed to reframe such pressing issues as environmental health, education, public health, early childhood development, addiction, environmental health, education, public health, and climate change. Prior to joining Frameworks, Mora worked for the Appearance Assistance Program of the Veer Institute of Justice, which developed alternatives to detention for immigrants in removal proceedings. Mora is trained as a sociologist, earning her master's and doctoral degrees from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mora Amin. Good morning. So nice to be here. Um, I want to thank the O'Brien Institute of Public Health. And again, just like Dr. Siddiqui did too, just really thank you, Mariko and Liara, for all that you've done to make this, this day possible and for us to be here and be able to talk to you. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about who we are uh, because I had just a wonderful introduction. Um, and I won't talk too much because it's too much about the examples of our work. But as you all know, in Alberta, if you've heard terms like toxic stress or the architecture of the developing brain or the idea of serve and return interactions with young children, um, this is research that we conducted with first with the Harvard Center on the Developing Child and then later working with the Palix Foundation, the Alberta Family Wellness Initiative to bring it here to Alberta. Um, so that our research just doesn't stay on the shelf, but is actually usable and actionable for people on the ground who need, who are working to tell stories uh, to, to impact some sort of social change. We work with all kinds of uh, networks, who uh, mostly of uh, children's advocates, who want to tell that core story of early brain development. Um, and we work on a range of social issues. So how to improve human services in the United States, climate change, ocean acidification, criminal justice reform, immigration reform. Um, I like to say that we wake up each morning thinking about a new dire social issue, which sounds like the worst job on earth, but it's not. It's wonderful because I get to be in rooms with people like you who are actually really doing the hard work of making change in your communities. Um, so we are mostly um, PhD level researchers and we are represented by all of the disciplines that have a dog in the proverbial fight over framing. Um, so up top of the slide are my, I guess they're just sisters now in linguistics. So they help us think about the structure of language. They help us think about rhyme and alliteration. Talking to them is just fascinating because they can tell you things like, if I tell you right now, uh, woes to my foes, you're more likely to remember it sort of embody it if I say harm to my em enemies. So that, that the impact of rhyme is very important. I'm trained in sociology. My brother's now in political science. Um, 
know that language is important, but we also know that language does not happen in a bubble. Um, that we can frame, to paraphrase a very famous thinker, we can frame, but not under conditions of our own choosing. So there's media gatekeeping practices. If you are telling stories for policy change, you are communicating in specific policy environments. So you need to understand those environments quite deeply in order for your messaging to be effective. We have um, more anthropologists than you can shake a stick at. Do not shake sticks at anthropologists. <laughs> they think you're engaging in some kind of ritualistic behavior. They start taking notes. Things get really weird around the office really quickly. But we keep them around. We love them. Um, because we are in the business of telling stories for social change. And in order to do that, you have to understand the culture in which you are communicating. And so anthropologists really have the, uh, the didn't, don't like to say this as a sociologist, but have very good methods for understanding culture. Sociologists can do it too, uh, but <laughs> anthropologists do it quite well. We're so interested in framing because it really was a paradigmatic shift across the disciplines I just named, and including others. Uh, when you think about public understanding or sort of human understanding of issues, it's not that how we're going to uh, interact with information is set, it, set in stone, but is shaped by context. So if I start talking to you like this, or if I talk like this, how I am communicating, those choices that I'm making to communicate with you are going to impact how you then understand what I say. I uh, just did that, and I did the screaming part in a, in a group of early childhood advocates. Of course, someone had brought a newborn infant. I screamed. <laughs> the baby screamed. So I almost want to start that, that part off with, are there babies in the room? Because I don't want to wake up a baby. Um, but it's decision points that you all in this room who are communicators make that are going to impact how your audience understands an issue. And I want to show you some examples of this. So this is sort of a classic study in political science. Uh, the researchers ask a group of people, given the importance of free speech, would you favor a hate group to hold a political rally? You get 85% in favor. You change the frame. You change just a couple of words. Given the risk of violence, would you support that rally? 40% in favor. So finally, I'm in a room of people who study statistics, and you know what a big deal this difference in response is. So again, just a couple of words, you get just incredible differences in how people are going to understand the issue, and then what they're going to do with that information. Are they going to favor this, this event happening in their communities? So this is what we study in our research. I want to show you a quick, quick example. So one of the methods that we use to test frames is what we call on-the-street interviews. So it's a sort of qualitative portion of our, of our research process. And what it is is I am one of those incredibly annoying people who flag you down on the street and ask you to give me a couple of minutes of your time. And you are a wonderful person who agrees to stop. And I will say, I do this in the US, and I do it mostly in Alberta. Um, and it's not that Canadians don't, Albertans don't turn me down. They're just very polite when they turn me down. So I, and I know that's just an incredibly stereotype that Americans have of, of Canadians. But in, uh, on my experience in, on the streets of Alberta, it's true. You reject me, but you're really nice about doing it. And that's why I love to do this research here. So I stop you. You're nice, and you decide to do the interview. So I say, um, I want to talk to you about children's issues. I want to talk to you about stress in children's lives. Tell me a little bit about what you think about it. And this is what you say. In this video, we're actually on the streets of London. It's a normal part of development, in my opinion. So stress is a normal part of development. I say, you know what? I want to talk to you about this idea of toxic stress, so environmental stressors, chronically activating the stress response system, which is going to have impacts on uh, children's developmental outcomes. And Dr. Siddiqui explained that science much better than, than I could right now. But I give that metaphor of toxic stress, and this is the conversation that we have. That causes, in my opinion, long-term damage to a, uh, a child. A lot of the emotional developments and the learnings that are meant to take place would, wouldn't happen in that situation. So two things that are absolutely amazing about that, this video. It's a difference of five minutes. She says, in my opinion, 
both times, but with a little bit more information, a little bit more explanation, she's able to have a conversation that's much more informed, first of all, but also sets up a very different proposition about what we as a society do to ameliorate toxic stress. So if it's a normal part of children's development, who cares, right? But if it's going to have these kinds of impacts, then again, we're in a different frame. We can start to talk about the policy solutions that we want to see. Now, we bring all of these PhDs to do this research because we believe that just as you are looking for policies that are evidence-based, you're looking for programs that are evidence-based, you can bring that same level of um, empirically minded thinking to your communications. There are tools that have been developed in the social and cognitive science sciences that allow you to understand what your communications are going to do. So this is one another method that we use to test frames. Um, these are online experimental surveys. We're out of London. We're now in Alberta. But we're talking about addiction policies. And the reason that we want to test these things is because oftentimes the decisions that advocates are making about how they're going to frame their issue actually are not advancing their policy uh, their, their policy goals. Um, so this is an experiment, exper uh, experiment we did here in Alberta. So one group gets the idea of interdependence. So we Albertans are all in this together. Solving problems related to addiction are a difficult problems, and we can do this together. The second is ingenuity. We in Alberta, we're a resourceful people. We know how to solve problems. We know how to get this done. Um, we can have practical solutions to sort of these problems that we think are intractable. And finally, you have the empathy frame. So we need to have compassion um, for people who are suffering from addictions. And the empathy frame really was what advocates we were working with at the time were using to promote policies uh, for addiction. So um, having more trauma-informed care, having care being longer, that it's not that, that this is understanding this as a chronic condition that needs sort of longer term uh, solutions. And this is what we found, that the empathy frame was actually depressing support for policy level changes. And in la later stages of our research, what we found is that what the empathy frame was doing, and this is important when I get into our discussion of the social determinants of health, was actually activating very individualistic understandings of addiction. So think of all the things that we as a culture in the US and you all have here too, that we talk about addiction. You've got to hit rock bottom. Nobody can help you until you want to help yourself. So when people are thinking about social problems as individual problems, it is very, very difficult to get them to see the kinds of policy change, changes that Dr. Siddiqui talked about in her, in her talk. So it's not that the, the advocates wanted to do that, but inadvertently their framing strategies were depressing support for the things they wanted to see happen. So we work on a wide range of, of issues, um, but there's two things that sort of underpin our theoretical uh, perspective on framing and communications. One is we take lots of cues from sociology. Um, and this is uh, C. Wright Mills, any sociology majors or in the so famous American sociologist, he distinguished between thinking about social issues as private troubles or um, issues that, that transcend local environments. And so at Frameworks, what we're trying to do is we're trying to use communications to help people understand social problems as issues. So on our work on early childhood development, it's not that parenting decisions don't impact children's outcomes. That's important. Right, But parents make decisions in certain kinds of social contexts. And for us, if you want to have the biggest bang for your buck, you want to change those contexts and not necessarily uh, go after the parents. Climate change. It's important that we do everything to reduce our, our, our carbon footprint. However, the scope of the problem is so large that we're going to need policy changes in order to do something. So that's the side of the ledger of communications we live on. The second thing is that <clears throat> framing um, is an important part of building social movements for social change. So Dr. Swan uh, talked today about putting on the heat, uh, right? And part of that for us 
is actually building public support, building public will for the kinds of changes that you want to see happen through your communications. Um, and so sociologists of social movements, uh, you know, there's all kinds of things that contribute to successful social movements, but one of those is the, the presence of a master frame, a common narrative. Um, there's been just wonderful stories about the civil rights movement. So we all know Dr. King as a man of faith, um, but his decision to draw on Christian symbolism for the civil rights movement was absolutely strategic because he knew it would work to bring more northern allied whites into the movement to create that heat to then uh, see policy change. Um, so again, the more and more people who are telling a common narrative, you build public support, you build public will, and over time you can see policy changes. But it's important to think about the kinds of communications campaigns that you want to engage in. And I want to distinguish between three types of campaigns. So the first is one that we all know um, it, it sort of through public health and communications as they're classically thought of as those campaigns that are designed to change behavior. And I want to show three different ads about uh, smoking cessation. So here's the first. lunchtime speaker <laughs> I was like, now you're all going to listen to me and stop eating. <laughs> um, the other kind of event is it, communications is change salience, right? Those sort of ribbons are the are a, sort of the classic example of that. So on smoking, here's, here's something we can see that sort of changes salience. In 1971, when one tobacco executive was reminded that smoking could lead to underweight babies, he said some women would prefer smaller babies. <laughs> Those healthy babies wear me out. Healthy babies are just no fun. Eat too much and they weigh a ton. It's really such a shame they have to grow. If three cheers of big tobacco growing healthy kids is wacko. Little bitty babies are the way to go. What? <laughs> but where we live at Frameworks, these are all important communications campaigns. Um, but where we live at Frameworks are communications that are designed to change social context. Uh, so here's an example of, of what this looks, has looked like on the issue of smoking. At Shards of Glass Freeze Pops, we want you to know where we stand on important glass freeze pop issues. We now agree there's no such thing as a safe glass freeze pop. The only proven way to reduce health risks from our glass pops is to not eat them. To learn more, visit our website. And remember, shards of glass freeze pops are for adults only. So this was really trying to get better regulation of the tobacco industry in the United States. So again, to change the policy environments in which people are making decisions about whether to smoke or not. Um, and again, those are the kinds of communication campaigns that we work on. Um, but the first step in this process, uh, when we work with groups, is that we, we know that we have to have a really good sense of what the public is already thinking about your issue before you are able to sort of um, start to shift things with uh, communications. And instead of telling you this, I want to show you this. So what I'm going to show you um, is a brief video. It's 90 seconds. It's silent, so no one's lost their hearing. And I want you to just sit back and watch.
Okay, show of hands. How many people told themselves a, a story about what was going on? Okay, you guys are very much like the original uh, study participants. Okay, does somebody want to tell me the story that they told themselves? Okay, go ahead. I would say that's kind of a teenager story where there is a mom and there is the daughter that is maybe dating someone that is completely different, maybe culture, maybe, uh, I don't know. Anyways, they are completely different. And what happens is it seems that mom, mom doesn't like what is happening there, that relation. And then she start like, uh, you know, just fighting with her daughter um, until they realize that there's no reason for them to keep fighting that way and they just move on with their life. Very good. Okay, one more story. A different. So you have a, the, a version of the star-crossed lovers story, right? Okay, another story. Anyone? Shout it out. Okay, go ahead. Um, I just thought the big triangle was a bully. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> tell me more. Tell me more. That's so the big triangle was a bully. And then the little circle was afraid at first, but then helped the little triangle get away. And the big triangle looks like it has some anger issues. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we could we could tell the stories all you know all day long, but the point is is that think about this. This was just geometric shapes floating in space, and yes, that line looks like a door, and that could be a house. But think of all the interpretation that you did. So we have gender. We have uh, discussions of culture and ethnicity and how that works. Um, you talk of emotion, right? These are just figures in space. But the point is, is that we are meaning-making creatures, that there is a story there whether you tell it or not. And so you need to know what that story is before you start to engage in, in a communications project. So, the theory that we draw on to sort of understand this, pro this sort of relationship between culture and human cognition um, comes, out, comes out of cognitive anthropology, and it's called cultural models theory. What cultural models are, are they're highly patterned, um, accessible ways that we have to make sense of incoming information. If you think about all that we have to process all of the time, we become um, what some scholars call cognitive misers. We have to make sense. We have to categorize quickly, but we become more practiced in certain ways of thinking. And what this means for you as communicators is that you can't think about your communication as going into an empty fishbowl, swimming around, uh, you know, in, in, in all kinds of ways, um, but rather the metaphor uh, that we like to use, um, sorry, uh, no, don't go on yet. Oh, it's not going back. Watch this, and then I'll tell you the metaphor. Lifestyle, if they exercise, if they smoke, if they drink a lot, do drugs and stuff like that. Lifestyle. Are they smoking, uh -huh. drinking, uh -huh. not eating healthy? I keep thinking of health as like what you eat and your weight. You probably eat out too often. Smoking. Your diet. Drinking and stuff. Some families might like raise their kids on fast food. Nutrition. Exercise is important. Too much fat, too much starch. Food. Bicycles and green culture. Bike more, uh -huh. drive less. Green ways to, uh, to do things, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, so the metaphor that we like to use is rather than a fishbowl, is a swamp a beautifully complex cognitive ecosystem. Um, one in which there are beautiful orchids that you want to fertilize with your communications, but there are dangerous alligators waiting to eat up the intended message of your meaning every time. And so you can see from this, uh, this is the map of your swamp on social determinants of health. The question that, that those group of people got were, what determines a person's health? And what did we hear? individual decision making. Um, there's no room for context. Um, and so when they think about health, they think about it as disease or healthcare, uh, you get, there's no discussion of mental health, of uh, sort of social relationships. Um, lifestyle is absolutely determinative of one's health outcomes. Um, what we've seen, you don't see this so much through through the, through the um, video, but we see a lot of sort of fatalism and determinism 
that if you're not healthy, that's just kind of the path that you're going to take because you've made wrong decisions and there's nothing we can do about that. Um, however, there are some orchids. You didn't see them in the video because they are recessive. They're recessive. They're latent. They're not always activated for people, but people do have a sense of what surrounds us, shapes us. They just don't get to hear that that often. Um, so knowing this map offers you a really strategic advantage because you can figure out what language cues you're using um, that might uh, activate those ways of understanding. So I'm going to show you a really brief clip uh, by Brad Shore, who's sort of a progenitor of cultural models theory, about why knowing this map is so important for people who are engaging in policy work. In the, in the realm of politics and policy debates, what the idea of multiple models suggests is that different advocates are not simply trying to impose arbitrary understanding on people, but rather they're trying to appeal to one or more of the models. They're trying to, in the way that I would think about it, is to change the salience of the models. That is, they recognize that for most people, it's possible for them to move between more than one understanding of something, such as the um, the understanding of whether what's more important uh, uh, you know um, uh, individualism and focusing on the moral individual or the notion of a communitarian value of focusing on what's good for the group well both of those are perfectly well modeled in, the, in, in American culture, as they are in most parts of the world. They're intrinsic, both are intrinsic parts of being human. The difference is, is that not whether one model exists and the other model exists, but the difference is which model is salient or foregrounded, which model is backgrounded and not salient. And often the difference between cultures has to do not so much whether models exist, but in these salient structures of what's foregrounded and what's backgrounded. The competition for the hearts and minds of people in policy work is the competition for restructuring salience and the understanding of what is in the foreground. Another way of thinking it is that the model that's in the foreground the, the value that's placed in the foreground is going to be the default reading that people have. Given, unless there's some careful work done, people will default to the model that is framed with, the certain, with, with, with a certain model up front. And the other one will remain not hidden, but latent in the background, maybe fuzzy. The job of a policy reframer is often to find a way to shift the background foreground function to get people to focus on something that they already know, but in a sense they might not know that they know. They might not be aware of it in the same way. So this to me is what makes framing so powerful. Framing is not spin. It's not putting an understanding that's not there. It's reminding people of what they know, but they may not know that they know. So people here, especially in Alberta, they do have a sense that context matters. But they're bombarded with information about personal responsibility for health. So it, it becomes easy to think. And so our job as communicators is to allow them to practice that muscle a bit more, to really explain the social determinants of health, to build that understanding. Um, and so. You can do this through your communications, but what we find is oftentimes that's not happening. So I'm not going to pick on anybody in Alberta. This is from Oregon and the States. This is supposed to be a communication that is uh, trying to explain the social determinants of health. But look at the language here. We won't go through, through this too much, but there are things that we can do right here in our community. OK, our community. What can our community do? Where do they go? Making personal behavior change isn't easy. But as you've no doubt guessed, we must stop smoking, improve our diets, and get more exercise. Now you can imagine just subtle shifts, right? We can have greater access to healthy foods. We can make sure that there's workplace policies that allow people to exercise on their breaks. You, we can, you can change that language, but where did they go? Straight to individual behavior change, which then feeds that alligator 
who's then ready to eat your message. Um, so what we want to do is we want to fertilize that orchid. We want to get people to think about context. So let's get these. So what do we do? How do we navigate these swamps? So I'm going to give you three quick framing fundamental <coughs> lessons. Uh, and the first thing is that values are important. Values are statements of what is at stake and why does this matter to our entire community. So it's not just that those people over there are affected, but when, those, when something is happening to that part of our community, we all are impacted. We are all responsible. And if we do something about it, we all benefit. Um, and so it's really sort of foregrounding the common good in your communications. Values are the reasons that probably got you guys on the dance floor for social determinants of health. You think about things like equity. You think about things um, about making sure everybody has they need in our communities to succeed. But what brought you to the dance floor does not necessarily get members of the public. You think about this issue all of the time. Most people do not think about most issues most of the time. We can't, right? We're too busy. Um, so it's important, again, to test the values that are going to work to build support for policies. Um, and I just want to give you a smattering of the policies that we tested uh, for our work on social determinants of health here in Alberta. Um, and so when I say a frame is working, and I think this is really important as you guys think about communications research, um, you always need to be thinking about what is the dependent variable. Right? What do you want your communications to, to do? So a lot of times you'll hear about resonance. Oh, people like that message. For us at Frameworks, liking the message, if it resonates for you, it's probably feeding an alligator. So that's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for really hyper-emotional <coughs> appeals because we know that sort of crisis talk can have people disengage. What we want to see is that at, at the end of the day, if we show you a message, are you willing to support these kinds of policies. So what do we find in the, the experimental survey on social determinants of health? That human potential, and I'll show you what, what this looks like in practice, was the most effective in lifting some of the policies that, again, the partners we were working with at the uh, office of the chief medical officer wanted to see lifted. Um, so the idea here is that, it, uh, here, that when we do something about social determinants of health, it enables people to fully realize their capacity to contribute to society, which in turn maximize society's potential to succeed. So it's really important here um, that the idea of human potential isn't that you can do what you want so you can succeed. It's that when we sort of invest in people's potential, we all benefit. So um, important uh, sort of ideas that are included in this frame is that we need the potential of all members of our society. When, when everybody doesn't have what they need, we're losing out. We're impacted. Um, people can contribute. They reach their full capacity. Um, and that we know what steps we need to take to promote wellness in this province. We have some ideas about what kinds of policy solutions will work. So you're really engendering that sense of, yes, we can. We can fix this. It's a big problem, um, but we can get something done. So here's an example of a communication without a value, sort of descriptive. I'll just give you a minute to read that. And here's what it would look like reframed with the value of human potential. So when schools promote now wellness, we all benefit from the next gener generation's greater capacity to learn, lead, and fulfill their potential to contribute to our communities. Um, the school, the important thing, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, is that there's a little bit more explanation in here. Here um, uh, is that you know, sort of the food and uh, physical activity environment plays a large role, role in the food students eat and the amount of physical activity they engage in. Um, and then you get to the facts. These fact sheets will provide you with an overview of school food and physical activity policy changes and uh, opportunities. So you're saying why this matters, how it works, and here's what you can do. So second thing, and I've just alluded to this, is that explanation matters. People do not understand the term social determinants of health. We can say it 
all we want, but they need to know what it means. They need those steps linked for them. Um, and so one of the tools that we use at Frameworks to do that explanatory work are metaphors. So we tend to think about metaphors as beautiful literary devices. Um, at Frameworks, we think about them as powerful devices for thinking. They allow you to map something that is completely unfamiliar to people, social determinants of health, onto something that is very familiar to people. Um, we take a lot of time to test whether uh, these, the, the metaphors that we are going to recommend to a group work. And instead of uh, me telling you why we do that, I will let Will Ferrell do it. <laughs> I don't like you. I think you're a fake cop. If we were in the wild, I would attack you. If I were a lion and you were a tuna, I would swim out in the middle of the ocean and eat you. Okay, first off, a lion? Swimming in the ocean? Lions don't like water. If you place it near a river or some sort of fresh water source, that makes sense. But you find yourself in the ocean, 20-foot wave, I'm assuming it's off the coast of South Africa, coming up against a full-grown 800-pound tuna with his 20 or 30 friends, you lose that battle. You lose that battle nine times out of ten. Where you thought it was going to go? Nope. So it just shows you the importance of testing these things out. So one of the, we work a lot on education and early childhood issues. One of the metaphors that were sort of dominant in the field uh, were computer metaphors that, you know, you kind of got to have good inputs, get good outputs. And, you know, we tested these with people. And he, there was a little as a problem. The domain was too close. So I say, if we think about children like computers, blah, blah, blah. Um, and people would say, yeah, kids these days really need to have computer skills. They need to, or we're all going to go to hell and wherever else we're going to go because they're, they're only on the internet. So they were thinking metaphorically. They were, they were thinking about children and their, their computer skills. Um, so it's these kinds of things that pop up in the course of testing that are, are really important. So the metaphor that tested best um, on the social determinants of health was this idea of a wellness grid. So access to healthy resources functions much like a power grid, but it's patchy and uneven in some places. So we need to expand it and repair it. So that's the metaphorical start, right? That's not the message, right? The metaphor is the thing that you would then hang your message on. Um, and so what it does is it allows you to open up all those sort of parts of the grid that are, that are determining health. You can get policy environments in there. You can get um, other kinds of determinants that are not just about individual level behaviors. Um, because there, it's patchy and uneven, there's a, there's a really nice space to talk about equity. In, in, with that metaphor, um, and it gets people away from this idea of fatalism. We can do things to patch this grid. So I want to show you, a, so I told you we do the pre and post on the on the street interviews, so I want to show you a, a video of post with people thinking and talking um, on the streets of Alberta, or in the mall in Alberta because it was winter. I was not going to go out on the streets at that part um, with wellness grid. What do you think it means to say that some communities aren't plugged into a resource grid. They don't have the resources, whether it would be the education, the, the educational level, the income level. Uh, they're on the margins of society. The poor communities are the communities that don't have much re representation, don't have as much opportunities or as much offer to them. And it doesn't flow as well. A grid represents a variety of services that people can or cannot access based upon their location, in our culture, in our society. People should be provided with, if they can't afford it, they should be provided for heat and utilities as well. That there's certain marginalized groups that don't have the resources to, as you say, plug in, which means access the resources that they need. Poverty is such a contributor to, uh, for health. It's the income not having the social capital, so to speak. Uh, the social economic resources to access a lot of these things or even know where to. The opportunities are really set up to go for the people that have the money to pay for them. People in poverty need a little bit more help when it comes to that. Like, you know, like I said, they don't know exactly what to do and they don't have the right um, resources. And only certain people can afford to have certain access. And that's not what we want. So again, think about that swamp video. Right? And I have a, I showed you a longer one. I have a swamp video that from that exact ball. Diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. A little bit of information, you have a fundamentally different conversation about what determines health and how those resources are not distributed 
equitably, which again, if, if we're in the frame of diet and exercise, um, what can we do? People just have to make better decisions. But if we're in a frame of talking about resources and people's access to resources, then we can start to have a very different kinds of conversation about the policies we want to see advanced. So another, so sometimes we don't want to use metaphors, um, but again, I can't sort of uh, stress enough the importance of explanation. So you all take a lot of the explanatory steps, not you all, but people that we reviewed, because I haven't reviewed any of your communications, I'm sure you guys are perfect, um, <laughs> take a lot of steps for granted. So it's social determinants of health and then this. You need to connect the chains for people. So um, what are the underlying causes and the visible problems? Um, take a few steps back and, and use, use because and as a result, sort of connecting phrases so that you help your reader connect the dots. So you remember on the, the, when we just tested human potential, OK? So human potential is doing some good stuff. It sort of drops off here in terms of statistical significance. When you add human potential with a social determinants explanation, you get all of these policies listed. And incredibly, policies designed to support First Nations communities which we found very difficult to move through communication. So again, this idea of we want to maximize everybody's potential to contribute to our communities, but we know that some communities aren't getting what they need to thrive and be healthy. This is because X, Y, and Z, you're getting um, statistically significant differences in people's willingness to support policies. Um, so again, here's an example of what this might look like. I'll just give you a second. I'm sort of running short on time, and I want to leave message uh, room for questions. Um, but again, just adding those connective phrases um, can do a lot in helping people engage in the kinds of conversations that you all are having with each other. Um, you're elevating the level of public discourse. And the, finding, the final, and I'll make all these slides available to you so you can see these before and afters. The final framing fundamental that I want to talk about today is that you need to emphasize solutions. So it is not that we are living in a world of sunshine and lollipops and everything is great. Problems are there, but they need to be explained. But people also, as much as they need a sense of urgency about a, a problem, they need a sense of efficacy, that there is something that we can do. And what we find is, uh, yeah, it's problem, problem, problem. The sky is falling. And then maybe on page 39, I'll tell you what I think we should do about it. Um, right? We want to, it is so easy inadvertently to activate the idea that health is only determined by individual choices. We do it all the time in how we speak and how, you know, I, I just can't stay on this diet. I know about the social determinants of health, but yet that's how I describe, uh, you know, my, my personal failings, right? Um, so to always point the, widen the lens to the context in which people are having to make decisions about, about their health. Um, you want solution stories. Don't try, if you can, um, to not use very jargony words. So um, again, it's not don't say social determinants of health, but explain social determinants of health. Um, programs and policies and services. Um, People tend not to understand what that means. Uh, so I'll just give an example. I, um, I work with early childhood folks all the time, and they would talk about services and policies and programs. I finally had kids of my own. One has a developmental disability, and she's in a wonderful program. And I said, aha, <laughs> these are these programs that everybody's been talking about, but I could not wrap my mind around without some concrete detail. And it doesn't mean I had to experience that. I just, as a non-expert, needed more detail, needed more explanation. Um, and again, it's, it's about not being in sort of competition and this side and that side, but here is what we can do as Albertans to make this better for everybody in our province. So I want to end with, you know, I gave you these quick and easy framing fundamentals, just go and do it, uh, that it's not as easy as that. Framing is not a switch, it's a sort of learning a new language. 
Um, and it's really hard work. And it's hard work not because it's a new language, but because of your swamp, because of the alligators in your swamp. Um, so I like to end on this quote, the advocates' messages tend to be complicated rather than simple, longer rather than shorter, and contrary to rather than consistent with popular understanding. For the most part, this means that we have to explain, our opponents have to state. We need to change people's minds. They just need to reinforce what people already think. We need to emphasize shared responsibility. They just need to highlight personal choice. So this is a hard job. But again, if you think about this from a social movement perspective, if everybody here starts to think about how we're going to better communicate about the social determinants of health, build public understanding, build public will, get that heat to sort of get those policies in place. Um, we've seen it happen before, and I think uh, Alberta is it's right for it to happen again. So thank you. Mm -hmm. part of a framing strategy, right? To develop curriculum at, at all levels to get people to think about these issues and think about things that can be done. So I think, I mean, that you're infusing a different kind of communication and all kinds of interesting touch points. So one example I'll give in the United States, we're working with people who are working on climate change, scientists who are working on climate change. Um, and we started to work with them where, where, where there's all that kerfluffle about uh, you know, climate change science being rigged, and then the emails were released, and so they realized that scientists weren't, um, at that point, the most credible messengers. So what they did is they came up with this brilliant strategy to train people who are working in an informal science centers in the United States. So when you go to an aquarium, those really nice, usually teenagers who are telling you about the coral reef, to train them to actually communicate translate the science of climate change and ocean acidification. And in formal science centers in the United States, more people visit those than they go to professional, uh, professional sports games. So it's an incredible opportunity to sort of diffuse this message. So what you're describing is something uh, very similar. Um, but it's, you know, you have a communication strategy, right? So I can point to you to the research. But you have to have a strategy strategy, right? A messaging strategy. How do you get the most number of people telling this story in all different kinds of places and some places that are unexpected? Wonderful talk. I'm <laughs> sure everyone feels this so uh, So given that there are, there are really very well-organized lobby entities in various sectors, the NRA, and, you know, many, many, other, many other domains. And many people sort of think that public health, people who work in public health sometimes think, well, we're losing the communications, the quote unquote battle. I don't like the term battle. But dichotomously, if there were two strategies, one is try to learn as people who work in public health to, to shift to a context based optimistic, change-focused way versus partnering with experts in communication strategy to, to, to advocate for fluoride and water supplies, vaccine, mandatory vaccination of healthcare workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Which of it is, it? like, you're going to say both. Uh, you, Which you, is you, it? you, you, really? you, 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 I'm not sure. I mean, no, I, I think it is both, right? So you set a frame. Like, if you're advocating for fluoride and you're advocating for gun control and you're advocating uh, for income transfers, right? If you all start to tell the story of social determinants of health and then you pivot to your specific policy solution, because that's the solution based story, you're lifting everybody's boats. 
right? You're, you're then helping your brothers and sisters who are working in education. You're helping people who are... So instead of thinking of all of these things as individualized policy silos, if you think of yourselves as a movement organized around the social de determinants of health that are going to be advocating for separate policies, but it's that long term. It's not just the legislative win. It's fundamentally transforming public understanding of these issues. It's long, it's hard, impact is hard to see, um, but we've seen it happen. And so that, that's the perspective that, that we come from. So you're, you're, and you're welcome to disagree with that perspective. <laughs> and I, as I was listening to you, I, I guess, strangely, I had the Ottawa Charter on the mind and the phrase in particular health becomes a resource for living. Is that based on the work that I think it's a really nice. Um, I don't. I don't know if we could take credit for that. Um, I, I'd have to do the research on that. But the Ottawa chart for health promotion already says that health is a resource for living, not the reason for living. I, I, I think that it's a nice instantiation of the wellness grid kind of idea. Yeah, and then, then you can plug that in. Mm -hmm. It also would say that you need to care for oneself and for others. And put a lot of emphasis, caring for oneself ends up being personal determined or personal choice and very, very quickly. But the caring for others maybe is something around that human potential piece. What I'm trying to do with you here and with our group is to think about how we move from what you've shown us to some of the ways that we have to talk to stay in the health space but that something as old-fashioned like uh, like an Ottawa Charter, if we breathe new life in it, into it, it might help us along. It's the resource for living piece is something that I, I personally believe in, and you're also suggesting uh, might help us to advance the conversation. So the only the only thing that I would add to that, I think that's right, is that to make rather than thinking of the individuals as the protagonists <coughs> in that story, yes. to make the grid the story, yes. right? And, and uh, a character, one that's driving action. So a beautiful example of this kind of storytelling uh, came out of the uh, California Newsreel. Um, what is? Uh, oh, I can't believe I'm uh, unequal. Uh, anyway, I unequal. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So you have you have a setting, right? Young girl, older man, right? They are still, and what changes is their neighborhood background. And that's the entryway into talking about the social determinants of health. So the character, the driver of action is the neighborhood. It's not, they stay the same. So it's not that you don't have people in your stories. It's that what they do isn't the driver of action, to get people to see how context shapes outcomes. So I think that it's important that, yes, people, people care, you take care of your oneself, but what is determining your ability to do that? And you can, it's, it's really difficult, right? Because that's how we tell stories in this culture. I did this, and then I came to this obstacle, and then I had to overcome, and it's this sort of man in whole. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut does this, this, I have this video, but I won't show it. Beautiful diagram of that story. But we also have access to another kind of story, and that's how the world works, those sort of Sim City stories. That, um, and so what we all, we have a really hard job is to be able to tell compelling stories about systems where systems are driving outcomes. It's hard. Um, I, you know, I can point to some examples, but um, it's a real communications challenge. So you did something like uh, resources are our health, just like we like, like reactivated that. So not health is a resource, but resources are health. Not everyone has the same kinds of resources. Therefore, we need to really think about what everyone needs to be a better able to create and use the resources available to them. Because this makes Alberta stronger. <laughs> because this makes everybody better, at all, better off. And then, you know, I would also even add layers of, again, you, this is, we're just, I would add layers of everybody doesn't have resources and this produces outcomes because X, Y, and Z. I mean, just, uh, you know, you would, when we sort of train people, we, we have them just, before you're going to be creative, just map out every step that you take for granted that when you're communicating about these things. But I think that's a beautiful outline. And the disasters like the floods and the, and the 
evacuation from Fort McMurray highlights how suddenly the setting that you're in could drastically change. And what we were able to do as a society was help one another. But we need to keep doing that and not just wait for fires and floods. That goes with it. Yeah. Yeah. Just based on your on your comment about neighborhoods, can you say a little bit? And I know it's like really deep, but uh, about community development and social determinants of health. Can you think about it in the grid? I'm, so, I'm sorry. So how would I? <coughs> how would I? How would you expanding on your neighborhood piece with the community development lens? Um, how do how do we? build some of that out and make that more purposeful? I would talk about sort of communities as potential sources of power to the grid. When communities have X, Y, and Z, we can make sure that that grid is not patchy for, for certain certain parts, uh, that, that, that communities matter. So I mean, off the top of my head, that's how I would do that. OK. I think that's all for questions. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.